in honor of all of you, I prefer to stand, and especially seeing such distinguished people and great friends. So Sylvia, thank you for uh, urging me to be here and delighted that I could come with Katrina, my wife, which is, of course, a double pleasure. And seeing quite a few friends, so Wouter, I haven't been able to say hello to you, but uh, great to see you, and you look in good shape. And, uh, of course, uh, I have particular pleasure to see in the front row the Minister of Environment of Argentina, Sergio Bergman. So, Sergio, thanks for being such a great follower here today. Well, I'm going to break with a few of the classical principles. I show these glasses there for the very simple reason that from now on, I urge you never ever to ask the question, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? The glasses are always full, either with water or with air. <laughs> so we need to make a shift in our thinking. And if we're not prepared to do the shift in our thinking, then we are not going to have water for life. We need to have life, and life is water. And it is a commons, as Pope Francis has said. There is not to be debate about this. Sometimes you have to say the way it is. And that means that you have to look at reality, not through your eyes as a scientist, not through the eyes of a politician, not through the eyes of a businessman, but you have to look at reality through the eyes of your children. These are three of my children. I have six. If you are not prepared to look at reality through the eyes of your kids, the world is going to look very different indeed. And this is the power that we have. You know, I'm not here to present you a new economy and say it's the end of globalization. What I want to tell you and ask you is let's work together on new business models. You know, the microeconomics is amalgamated into the macro. You can discuss macro whatever you want, but you will not change unless you change the microeconomic model. And we have given companies a license to operate, and they're operating within their license. Don't criticize them. Change the license. And that's part of our work, is we have to put, finally, ethics in the core of the business. If you don't have ethics at the core, then we are falling in this trap. And the trap is the following. Doing bad is bad. Doing less bad is bad. <laughs> Saving water is not good enough. And refusing to do good is very bad. Now, if we could just keep these three simple principles in our mind, then we will be able to change the way business is operating. I have the great privilege and honor to have worked in 94 on the preparations of the Kyoto Protocol, 94-97. I don't go to Paris. I didn't go to Marrakesh. I was in Kyoto. And what I think is very important is we have to stop just being a think tank. We have to start being a do tank. Do things. And do it so radically that even the Huffington Post takes notice. You know, the Huffington Post has called me the Steve Jobs of sustainability. But you know, they said the day of the election that there was a 2% chance that Trump would get elected. So don't take him serious. My Latin American friends call me the Che Guevara of sustainability. I'm neither. I'm not Che Guevara. I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm a citizen dedicated to transform society and to make certain we do it very different indeed. And, and let me start you with my first big critique. 30% of the city water is used to flush toilets. Come on! When I came to the world, and at least for nine months, most of the babies, we don't use flushing toilets. It's all dry-based. Why do we shift it and use drinking water? This is, to me, one of the unacceptable things. And, and this little device that in airports consumes 6,000 liters per day is a sign of insanity. I'm sorry. And you can solve it in no time. 
at no cost. And why don't we do it? If you want to know how, come to me afterwards. <laughs> but we have to create more drinking water faster. And the only way to do it is to plant trees. Not reverse osmosis, not vortex technologies, none of these plasma stuffs. That's all way too expensive. You need to change the surface temperature of the soil. That means the temperature must get shade. And if you have shade, you will have more rain, period. It's the laws of physics. Physics, the laws are always the same. They never change. So yes, if you don't have the trees, then you have 70% of the population suffering from gastrointestinal diseases. That's your nexus. Paolo Lugari, my partner and friend since 1984, and I do hope when the Pope is going to Colombia, we see this project where we regenerated 8,000 hectares of barren land that was destroyed by the Spanish 250 years ago, and we regenerated the forest. Regenerating the forest is key. We have to give the earth its skin again. You don't give it a skin, you don't regenerate the biodiversity. But key is that when you have trees, you can develop an economy. When you have trees, we in this area called Las Gaviotas, in El Bichara de Colombia, we have generated full employment. Full employment in an area where we thought it was not possible. And when we decided to create the full employment, water was the core business but a special business. Because 90% of the water is distributed for free to anyone who comes there. And 10% is sold to the rich in Bogota who pay the same price for Las Gaviotas water as for Pellegrino or Evian. This is smart economics. But we give three liters of water for free. Three liters of water for free. And did you know that this area of Colombia de Vichada, 80% of the people living there were refugees. Refugees from the drugs, from the cocaine, from the violence. So refugees started by drinking water. And we have another little detail added to it. First, the water is for free. And second, children at the age of six receive a bicycle as a gift. What happens to a child that drinks three liters of water a day and rides the bike all day? Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of announcing you that we have to close the hospital because of a lack of patience. <laughs> this is development. This is really putting life at the core. And what I think in the same line, we have to look in the eye, the disasters that we continue to organize with water. And the biggest disaster, of course, is gold and mercury. Have you looked at that nexus? Mining? Mining is the disaster of the world because we've chosen to still do it with mercury, with a Kazakhstani mafia bringing the mercury, even by submarine, to the Colombian coasts. Ladies and gentlemen, are we ready to look it in the eye, how it looks like? There's 180 tons of mercury smuggled into Colombia every day. It's the greatest ecocide, and it's all done with water. Are we willing to look it in the eye and say, no more? This is gold mining in Colombia, ladies and gentlemen. There can be no peace when you solve that. There has to be a solution. And why is that gold so disastrous with mercury? Because it's worth 18 times more than cocaine. It's easy for the gorilla to give up cocaine. That's only 18 times less than the gold. And so therefore, we need to look this in the eye and change the business model. And the change of the business model in this case is that we have to realize that gold is harvested as a dust. And then we produce an ingot. But 26% of the world market doesn't use ingots, they use dust for medical equipment, for your telecommunication equipment, for your computers. So we're melting gold twice.
Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you use the dust at once? We're introducing this technology in Colombia because I cannot fight the guerrilla and the mafia of Kazakhstan, but I can create better. And we have to have in our mind that the creation of better is what is our vocation in life. Create better. Always go for better. And we have started in Colombia this operation to crowd out, to crowd out mercury by using new technologies. If you want to know how it works, talk to me later. What is key is that agriculture is consuming 70% of our drinking water. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tell you that drip irrigation is just not good enough. Drip irrigation is, for me, archaic and old history. No irrigation, that is going to be the rule of the game. And it's not genetics that's going to do it. But first, a little wake-up call. When you like your steak, remind you yourself that 15,000 liters of water is needed for one kilogram of steak. And if you're a chocolate freak, it's 17,500. Ladies and gentlemen, you love chocolate, you consume water massively. So keep in the same spirit, don't get negative. Think positive. How can we solve it? And the way we've solved it is focusing on a project around tomatoes, pomidori. And we have succeeded in Australia, in the desert, to start farming pomidori, tomatoes, thanks to a German from Munich who decided that the land was cheap and he was going to for the plentiful. This is the technique, but it's a simple one. It's again the laws of physics. You take cold water from the sea, you let it flow through the ground, goes back to the sea, you create a space over it, and what do you have? Condensation. The laws of physics are so predictable, you can bank on them. That's the beauty of physics. Now, this has been translated in 2009 in this pilot project. But ladies and gentlemen, we are today at 17,000 tons of tomatoes, and for every kilogram of tomatoes, we produce 25 liters of water. We have gone from irrigation and drip irrigation to no irrigation to generation of water. That's what we have to do. You tell the engineers to figure it out, they will figure it out. If you tell them to reduce, they will reduce. If you tell them to reduce, they will reduce. If you tell them to stop and do different, then they will do different. And this is very important. Just this little project saves 3 million tons of water for 17,000 tons of tomatoes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the country of tomatoes, right? This is the country of uh, salsa bolognese. This is the country where you are using pomodori all the time. Country with perhaps one of the largest coasts of Europe. You have thousands of kilometers of coasts, and not one tomato is farmed in Italy today using the coldness of the deeper Mediterranean Sea. The project is also self-sufficient in energy. Now, may I ask you, if you, have, if you have a desert where nothing grows and no water is, and you turn that into a place where tomatoes grow and water is produced, what's the value of the land? Investors follow. And that is why I'm very glad to have Mariana Bozasan here with us, a fellow member of the Club of Rome as well, who's organizing a conference in October of the investors that are exactly focusing on this. You need to mobilize the capital, the angels who see that this is new, but this is real. And we need to make it real. 100% self-sufficient in energy and a net producer of water. That's the tomato of the future. Nothing less. Tomatoes that produce water. And by the way, they're half cost. By the way, we're outcompeting everyone. So as a result, I have taken on with my foundation and 3,000 researchers the challenge to keep on focusing on things that are so fundamentally different that it bothers a couple people. But I have decided that I didn't come to the world to please everyone. I came here to do a transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're looking at is China inventing paper 
and 2,000 years later, China reinvents paper, paper that is produced without the use of water, using mining waste. I have a book with me that is produced with mining waste. Why do we want to cut trees? Why do we want to cut trees when you can just use mining waste and use no water at all? And it's recyclable forever. Can you imagine? You can print the Bible and 2,000 years later you can read the same Bible. It doesn't disintegrate like so much other things do. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a very different game that we have to play. But what we have to force is innovation that is more than innovation. It's changing the rules of the game. We need to change the rules. In this case, China is our partner. We have four factories, one million tons now, and we have saved three billion tons of water. Just with one million tons, and we're only 0.2% of the world market of paper. Can you imagine? Imagine how far we can go. To summarize, what I propose with the blue economy and these four little projects I presented to you is that we have to be innovative. We have to focus on employment. We have to generate value. We have to change the rules of the game, and ethics must be at the core. And one of the greatest uh, things that I have been so privileged with is to have people who inspire me, people who are mentors. Because please don't ever think that I am the one concocting all of this. We need people to be inspired by. And therefore, my greatest responsibility is not writing books like The Blue Economy. My greatest responsibility is to inspire children. I don't want to teach kids anything. I want to inspire them. Kids need inspiration. And therefore, I've decided with my wife, Katrina, we are producing fables, children's stories, like this story about making stone paper. You know, every child in China has received the fable, paid for by the Communist Party and the government, but every child knows that the future of paper is stones from the mines, taking the dust out of the air. I'm now at 144 fables. China wants 365. Every project that we implement is translated into a children's story. Until today, the only government that has been willing to expose all their children to it is surprisingly the Chinese government. Yes, I have a few Catholic schools since I went to the Jesuit University. I have my contacts as well. But not everyone is subjected to it yet. We need to inspire children like this story in China whereby we're, China doesn't have water anymore to grow cotton. And so now we have the first two million ton factory making textiles out of seaweed. Textiles out of seaweed, producing water while we're making the textiles. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't think like this, I don't give the world a great chance to solve the water problem and so many other things. My final words in Spanish. La moderez consiste en realizar los sueños. You reach maturity in life when you achieve your dreams. I have lately changed that to maturity in life is achieved when you can go beyond your dreams. When it's all about water, ladies and gentlemen, we have to go out of the nightmares and beyond our dreams and navigate between fantasy and reality as all children do. Thank you.